Hi, everyone. Welcome to Johnny's Juke Joint tonight as uh, I interview live my longtime friend and musical compatriot, the great trumpeter J. Michaelak. Now, Mr. Michaelak completed musical studies at Northwestern University uh, with a Bachelor of Music. He also went to the University of British Columbia for his master's. Um, he, I believe, studied at the Aspen uh, Music Festival and School and also at the Banff Center. Uh, he was a finalist in the Ellsworth Smith International Trumpet Competition. He's performed with the Chicago Civic Orchestra, the Calgary Civic Symphony as a soloist, the Foothills Brass Quintet, the Tacoma Symphony, the Bellevue Philharmonic, the Lyric Brass Quintet of Washington, um, the Ensemble Noir, ooh, spooky, of Toronto, uh, Altius Brass, the Kensington Symphonia, and the Calgary Box Society, and the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, all in Calgary. Uh, he recently started teaching secondary music at West Island College in Calgary, uh, and he is the lead trumpet player for the Calgary Jazz Orchestra and uh, the Johnny Summers Little Big Band. And uh, please welcome Mr. Jay Michaelak. Jay, are you there? Hey, Johnny. How's it going, man? Good. How are you, bud? Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Man, it's so nice to see you. It's been too it long. It has been... It's been a way long time. Um, it's, I mean, even just seeing people over Zoom now, it's still like, ah, oh, you're there. Yeah. <laughs> really, it's, I can't wait till we get a chance to get together and, and play. You oh, know, I think we both had a few things starting to happen, which is really cool. I mean, get a taste of it. Um, you just can't wait to get back to performing, especially with the big group, right? That's the, that's the treasure, right, we want to get to. It's at the end of the rainbow, man. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing quite like that. The Calgary Jazz Orchestra is looking at uh, launching its 17th season on in October. So, um, yeah, I think you've probably already been contacted by the by them. Yeah, so. I got them all on my date it book, and they're circled, and uh, yeah, I'm skipping everything until then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man, it's... Uh, and it's going to be tough to get back into shape for some of that lead trumpet playing, I imagine, like a whole night of... <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. There's a there's a, a certain amount of here. training uh, that goes into that. It, you know, I think the notes are still there, but uh, two hours of notes, uh, we'll, we'll have to work up to that a little bit, or perhaps four when we get the get to Frank concert at Christmas. When we get to the uh, double shows, yeah, yeah, that that's exciting, and it's, two in it's one a day. great challenge. It is, it. But you know, it's funny how that's not. Because I'm thinking, even even on those shows, the perfectly frank Christmases, I'm as a singer, um, I'm thinking like, oh no, can I do four hours of? Because a lot of it is pretty aggressive singing. Like the Sinatra stuff is is a unique skill set, and then we for some of that Christmas stuff, some of the some of the range and stuff is tiring. It is like, absolutely. <laughs> You know, it's uh, you get to the end of the first show and you're like, yes. And then you're like, wait a second. That's just you know, I have enough left. Yeah. Know. But that's, you know, that's where you lean on your bandmates. Right. You know, especially yeah. like as a lead trumpet player. Right. I mean, you know, I can tap John or Al or Chris, whoever's playing. And, you know, hey, guys, I'm just going to lay back a little bit, you know, and maybe, you know, save a little bit for those really big shouts. Right. You know. And, you know, just try to remind the whole band, you know, sometimes, you know, we always want to play fortissimo, right? I mean, you've seen those trumpet player dynamics, right, Johnny? Yeah, you know? uh, M Metz MF means Maynard Ferguson. Uh, more uh, more power. Oh, MP is more power, yeah. Yeah, and P is just power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dynamics, I'm playing oh, as yeah, loud as I can. Power plus. Yeah, <laughs> power plus. <laughs> triple, triple P is pressure, pressure, pressure. <laughs> Oh gosh. Okay. Um, how many? Do you know how many years have you played with the with the CJO? I was thinking about that earlier, and it's it's got to be eight or nine. I'm thinking. I think so. Yeah. It's, it's somewhere in that range. I, I was trying to think back to my my first show, and um, do you remember what it was? I I, I was trying to recall it. It was it was jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Which for me at the time Your was memory like, oh. is astounding. Can you teach us how to recall these facts? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, no, I just remember it. You know, we were at uh, uh, the River Church, and it was just yeah, it was really exciting. But yeah, I was like, okay, this is cool. This is different. This is new for me. Like I hadn't played a lot of big band, you know, in a period from like, you know, probably like two thousand four to ten. I'd played some with the uh, prime time big band. 
but there weren't you know a ton of things that I was I was doing. It was mostly touring with the quintet, right? Pretty with pretty the solid. Brass. In the, yeah, Foothills Brass Quintet. Yeah, pretty pretty and solid. Play a lot of classical and and mostly hip-hop. classical, some jazz, right? Yeah. Some some pretty screaming stuff, but you know it wasn't like playing you know leading a big band. But trains yeah. you in other ways for sure. The endurance you need for quintet certainly I, helps I, the endeavor of playing lead. I uh, I was fortunate to sub for you um, on one of those Foothills Brass shows uh, just before the lockdown, and uh, like the it, Christmas one, right? I don't think it was out, Christmas. Out in like uh, Strathmore or like, something. It was, it was a concert. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what it was. Yeah, something like that. And but it was um. It, it's tough the 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 um see and i don't think that most people who aren't trumpet players understand how how worn these corners get and how difficult it gets to even make a sound um if you don't study efficiency and 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 temper yourself have temperance while you're playing uh, <laughs> when you want to just you know you want to be able to rip at any second but if you don't watch it uh, you'll wear yourself out really quickly. You know, it's it's an oh. endurance race. Playing Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I grew up, I mean, really one of my biggest influences when I was young. I had two, Maynard Ferguson and Maurice Andre, right? And they're pretty much exactly the same style of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so. Right? But, uh, you know, when I hear jazz, you know, I'm, I'm really often hearing that Maynard, just that searing sound and you know i like to do that but it takes a tremendous amount of energy right it does so you have to you have to pace yourself and like you i think you said efficiency and that's that's the name of the game i think really um i spent a lot of time focusing on um ease of response you know just trying to get any extra tension out of my body um that might interfere with uh, the response of my lips or the flow of the air Mm -hmm. and just try to make that you know, basic response of my embouchure and lips in the middle register, like between E and G, mm-hmm. make that as pure and easy as possible and really reliant on air as opposed to any sort of, you know, extra grip or having to do too much in terms of movement or shape change, you know, just trying to keep everything very even keel up and down the horn. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's trying to play it more like a saxophone would, right? Just wiggle your fingers. They're easier <laughs> to play, yeah. The... Um... <laughs> Uh, can you play us something uh, something classical and fancy on the trumpet to, to open? Sure. Before we get going too high, I mean, I, I was doing a little bit of warm-up on Carnival of Venice. It's been several years since I played this, but it might be fun to play a little bit of that. All right. Maybe, maybe the theme and then one of the variations or something. Come out doing that. Come out swinging on that. Um, <laughs> awesome. Where were you born? Where was I born? I was born in the mecca of Blue Island, Illinois. Oh, I've I've uh, never heard of it or been there. It's uh, within that sort of blob we would call Chicago. So oh, okay, yeah. I <laughs> consider sh- myself a Chicago, and even though I never actually lived in the border, it's people in Chicago do that, right? It's kind of like the GTA, right? Yeah. You know, like anywhere 100 miles out of the direction. Where are you from? I'm from Toronto. Yeah. yeah. Same thing with Chicago. I'm from Chicago. Yeah. When I was in New York, I was in Jersey, but I didn't tell anyone that. Yeah. No, <laughs> you kind of skip those things, right? <laughs> Don't admit uh, to it. Where are you staying? Um, New York area, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds way better. <laughs> okay. So we talked about, uh, just briefly mentioned, uh, Maynard Ferguson and Maurice Andre, and it's interesting because Maynard is not uh, how I write for the CJO unless we actually did like our Maynard Ferguson show. So then yeah, it's yes. like full on Maynard when we used his charts and stuff. But 
um, it's very different the way that that um, you know we we play lead there. But so so who who were your um, your early trumpet heroes and why? Why Maynard? Why Maurice Andre? And anyone else you can think of? Well, yeah, I mean Maynard was just that the fire, you know, and the the bravado and. Yeah. Just the burn. I, and, you know, you just, I don't know, like, I think you either like it or you don't, but if you like high notes and you start hearing what he's doing, you're like, yes! It's it's, it's a little more like a sporting fun. event or something. Yeah. I don't know, but <laughs> it really gets you, it really got me fired up. And so, you know, and I think about a lot of, like, a lot of trumpet players. Like, I think yeah, he led absolutely. a lot of us to, you know, to, to, to just get excited about the instrument. Yeah, and it was like grade eight or nine, I think. Uh, I think it was at end of grade eight. I was practicing at my grandparents, and I just like, okay, I'm doing this. And I just started reaching for some of the high notes, and I got, you know, double F, and I got a G, and I'm like, holy cow. And yeah. then I passed out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of fell back on the floor. I wasn't doing it right at that point, but. Your I think compression with... was in weird places. Yeah, um, you just get it done, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but did, Maurice. Did I ever just... tell you once? Oh, yeah. That... Go ahead, man. I had hired a lead trumpet player um, to play a show, and they were on. I, I want to say a dub playing like the the top of the chart was just an A. That was all I'd written at the end. It was a very powerful ending, and I think it was just an A. And he he tried to take it up an octave, which he does have in his arsenal, like a double A, but um, or an A below double C, depending on which trumpet player we're talking to. But um, <laughs> you know that's that's right up here you know right and uh the second trumpet player uh, it was the first and, and only time i'd hired said trumpet player but the second trumpet player caught him as he passed out and caught him and both of their horns somehow and uh i i mean it happens right like just having that that um inefficient approach and i think we've all done yeah. it. yeah like. and you know you don't like you can't always go for it like you want to yeah, there's sometimes you just got to know better, and I think that comes with experience. And it's true, you but know, it's just, more musical yeah. to not attempt the what you know is not possible. Yeah, and then, but sometimes you do, and you surprise yourself. So it's it's yeah. really hard to say, right? But there's um, also the the uh, the fact that Maynard would do that every night and go for it and scream it through every night and just power it through. That that was, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, he was doing it right. He was doing it very the right way, right? Oh man! You know, speaking of Maurice, though, like yeah, I, I, was, I was gonna tell you a little bit about my connection to Maurice. Is it just that super sweet, clear, ringy tone, and it was just so graceful and civilized, right? I mean, I remember, I remember very specifically the album my dad gave me, an LP. That's a large CD. Oh, we don't even know what CDs are anymore, do we? <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, he gave me an LP, and you know there he is in a blue leisure suit, but just playing, you know, like like an angel, right? Mm -hmm. This must He's be. One of I remember, uh, you know, him playing the Telemann trumpet concerto on that album, and just that first look. I'll give it a try here, just because it's in my head, and I just have to try it. I'm gonna slide it down to A, kind of approximately, but he just comes in. Are you kidding me? It's just so beautiful. It's like I have to be able to do that. And he melts butter. I don't care what it takes. Effortless. And the tone was gorgeous and in tune and soulful. And totally. So, oh, he, yeah, he's one of my. And best. articulate too. Yes. That's the one thing I don't feel I've ever quite captured is his just like just juicy, tasty articulation. But uh, since I got this little thing out, my lovely piccolo trumpet. Yeah. You got maybe I play a, a Beatles song. You like the Beatles? I've heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's these really cool cars they stopped making a few years ago yeah <laughs> uh, i've always had an affinity for the uh, the penny lane solo of course yeah yeah just which great, great. Uh, i just heard the gentleman who played that solo mm -hmm. i guess when they were recording that song they had a bunch of different instrumentalists come in and the i, I can't remember his name right now you might the I don't recall offhand, sorry. I can't yeah. recall either, but the piccolo trumpet player who did that, they brought him in, and he wrote that part, Yep. and then he played it, and because he wrote it, he retained points on the composition of that amount of time, and so he made a lot of beaucoup de dinero. 
He's still making yeah, you know, all that. from that. That's really that cool. Is... If you're ever, for, for some and reason, if you're ever perfect. at the Hard Rock Cafe in Orlando, mm-hmm. they have that piece of music. Oh, do they? That's cool. In a glass case. That's cool. I was there once and just walking by and, oh, you know, I was the one person who's ever pressed himself up to the glass, <laughs> you know, breathing at it. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, my God. Most people are drooling over Jimi Hendrix um, jumpsuit or something, but. Well, they also they have uh, John Lennon's couch, his composing couch upstairs there. That's kind of cool. Pretty cool. That's pretty, pretty cool, cool, actually. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, you want to hear a little Penny Lane? Absolutely. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> that's um, that's something else. Yeah, we'll get to that later. That's the oh, other. Uh, the cucaracha is different than a beetle. That's a different. I'm not an entomologist, but that's. Does it translate? <laughs> it might. All right, here we go, brother. been thinking for a long time of writing a Beatles show for the for the CJO to play it maybe uh maybe we will maybe it'll come out some somehow yeah yeah reimagining yeah, all of it one. except for that part you know? no that one yeah I just got that it's perfect yeah oh that's just a that's a joyful piece to play right yeah this joy really is so we're thinking of we're so we're, you were you were listening to some of your heroes your your um and your reasons for for liking them and one of the things that's come up lately for me, and I've had some people ask me this question, and I think it's an interesting one, is what was the secret of, for you, of bridging the gap between being a student and coming through university and practicing, practicing, and becoming a professional? What are, what are some things that we can tell people that are trying to, because even when they come out of university, um, the expectation may be that that they'll get the jobs or get hired, but it's not always the case. And what is it that bridges the gap there for them, for us? Yeah, that's a huge question. Hey, it is. There's a lot of a lot of things that come to mind. I mean, you have to pit it. You have to put in the time, and you have to build the ability to move around the instrument. Um, it was really about uh, I would say when I was about 26 or so, decades ago, actually. <laughs> Oh, actually, actually, <laughs> um, I, just figured, I had some lessons with uh, Jens and actually Sam Palafian, the tuba player, right? Late great Sam Palafian. Um, just about efficiency and breathing, and I really got into uh, now Jens learning is how crazy to move, efficient on the instrument. Yeah, move the air kind of really plays. freely. Yeah. You know, because when you and it, what encouraged me actually, I, I, I wish I remembered her last name, but I met a trumpet player at the Northwestern Trumpet Seminar. Her name is Mary. And it just struck me how easy the response on her instrument was, right? And I was like, man, she just took a breath, boom. And there was this great, gorgeous, big sound without any work. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's gotta be possible. You know, so I went about the task of trying to like really get myself out of the way. And what I found is the, you know, sort of the combination of getting rid of excess tension, but also still maintain sort of that strength. And of course, you know, all the technique, articulation, fingers, all that stuff. Uh, the combination of making it easier and getting stronger, like opened up the horn for me, so to speak. Like we all have to learn how to play our horns, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then, you know, you have access to music a little bit more, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like to get hired, you've got to be able to play. Right. And then it's a matter, you know, really listening and living the music that you're playing, whatever it is. Right. So up to that point, you know, I had played a lot of jazz, but I was primarily focused on living, uh, you know, classical solo repertoire and orchestral repertoire. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was really it was almost about that same time, I would say, uh, that I started playing a lot more by ear. Um, And it came up because you mentioned the uh, the Ellsworth Smith uh, trumpet competition, I sort of made it a goal to make sure I had memorized everything, which I don't know if it's not required or is required these days, but at the point it wasn't required to memorize everything. But I was like, I just made it a point. I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. I was actually the only, the only participant who had memorized like the eight pieces or whatever. And 
what I found worked is I would play it through a couple times, you know, listening to it a bunch, of course, and then I would put the music away. And I would essentially try to recompose it. Yes. Right? And you can go really slow, note by note, and try to get through a phrase. And I'd go back and check to see if I got it right. But I was essentially trying to recreate it here. And that made a huge, huge difference for me. And then, like, basically from there, I memorize almost everything I play. Um, kind of by default like I don't even necessarily have to try it's usually kind of there right right um, so I would say you know and then just of course immersing in the music like I said immersing in the music you're playing um, you know so I'm actually teaching a fair bit of jazz uh, right now teaching I started teaching the jazz YYC lab band mm -hmm. which is a really really cool uh, uh, ensemble but just really making sure I've got you know, not even, not just the brass sound, but also the, the rhythm section sounds in my head so I can help those kids, right, move along. That's opened up a whole new set of uh, ideas for me. Like, you know, like I'm learning by teaching, right? Mm -hmm. And so whatever you do, just immerse in it. You know, listen to, you know, if you're going to play pictures at an exhibition, listen to 10 great trauma players play that. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And see what they do and try to live in that moment and hear their sound before you play. I've never see understood. What you like. See what sticks, right? Uh, and I've never understood a music education where they don't demonstrate that, where they don't play, um, play for the, the students or demonstrate it themselves or through a recording um, or when we're studying to just listen, 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 listen. That's, that's huge. That's great advice. Um, we just got a yeah. comment. I keep from, my horn in my hand all the time, Johnny. <laughs> I know you do because we've it keeps played me together shape. for a Good. lot of years <laughs> um i can say that to everyone listening like when we when we've toured when we show up at like we'll we'll tour and and you'll be practicing when we take a, a break at a gas station or or um <laughs> we'll be setting up and um um i'm usually you know doing um band leadery things and and you're <laughs> sitting down in the front row um, practicing the telemon or something completely unrelated to what we're doing because you're doing it next week somewhere or something and or you're right. looking at lines about what we're about to do tonight because you're you're going over it again I mean I know and um, uh, uh, I, I I envy that in you and I try to do that as much as I can you know when I'm balancing all these other things too but yeah, I hear I've, you, I've seen you do it man. You. I've seen you do it and I, I just got a comment from um, somebody you may know uh, saying Keith Jerry Michaelak saying my favorite trumpet player. So I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming they're talking about me, of course. Yeah, Thank of you, course, Keith. Johnny. Uh, I really appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what are you seeing then? And th this is a question that I, that I always love to ask, um, but especially with trumpet technique, because I think efficiency is one of the most necessary things. Um, to, to be successful on a, any brass instrument and on a trumpet. Um, so what are your things that you see most trumpet players struggling with and how do they overcome that? I think, you know, amateurs and, and students alike, I think a lot of folks use more, more lip energy than they need to. Absolutely. And I think it's so much as a defense mechanism. I mean, like, think about it. You remember, I don't know if you remember your first notes. You know, they're like, and then you're like, mm, uh, uh, get that note. You want to get that note. You want that success, right? Yes. You know, the instrument itself, almost from day one, uh, teaches us to work hard to get it. Right? It's like, you know, it, to be certain you're going to get it, you have to work a little hard. I, I honest like in mean, all my years teaching and touring around and doing clinics, I, you know, I've heard one kid, and this is in Northeast Calgary, I remember this, this is probably 15 years ago, you know, they're like, okay, now we have one of our students, this is grade five, one of our students is going to come play O Canada when you do play O Canada at the concert. We're like, okay, you know, and the kid comes down and is just playing with this beautiful open tone. And, you know, he sounded beautiful. And, you know, I, I remarked those. Like, I, I, I've rarely seen a, somebody kind of feel natural on an instrument from day one. It's rare. You know, like on a, on a trumpet, specifically. Very because rare to see on the trumpet. It, it does give you pretty strong feedback in terms of the resistance, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think one of the keys to 
you know, to really being successful physically on the instrument is to, you know, find that efficiency, which I think in a lot of ways means finding a way to, you know, to get a note, you need a certain amount of energy, right? Mm -hmm. You have to draw on the energy from the universe, you know, circular energy. <laughs> but it, it either comes from lip or, or, or your air or your pinky finger, your octave key. Pressure, you pressure, know, pressure. Um, trying to find ways. It's almost like, you know, that book Zen and the Art of Archery, right? Only using what you need to make it work. Right? There was, um, I remember, this is something I distinctly remember. One of my other heroes, Wynton Martellus. You heard of him? Um, sounds familiar. <laughs> It was like a PBS special or something, you know, and he's probably early 20s at this point, but he had uh, his mouthpiece tied to a string. Have you seen this? I haven't and seen it. No. He, he basically, he starts a buzz for a double C on his lips without the mouthpiece, walks up to it, puts it in, comes to the mouthpiece, and then walks away. Yeah, like, that struck me as like, holy cow, you actually don't need this. You know to do it and that's obviously that's that's wicked extreme and like and you know i've seen uh um i have seen uh lynn nicholson he used to uh, tour and play with uh, maynard for years and years um crushing lead trumpet player Cr crushing 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 like crazy zing in the upper register um just with a rim which is where you know you know what that means but for everyone yeah. else it's just basically they just take this this top round piece of the mouthpiece so mm -hmm. with no cup or anything and puts it to his lips and plays double c's and above you know like and plays melodies screaming up there and you'd swear it was almost sounds like a trumpet like just just on his chops right that's but, amazing um yeah. so I, I i yeah it's pretty impressive it definitely um, def demonstrates a certain concept i mean and one of the things even if even if you can't buzz you know, successfully, like I, like I can barely buzz melodies, you know, on my, you know, my lips without the mouthpiece. I don't, I don't think it's a big deal, but I do think studying the principle of that free air movement without a rim there, or like you said, with a cutout, something where you actually just take away the resistance is really valuable, you know, because going back to that, the concept of the, you know, that starting resistance and teaching you kind of defend against it. Yeah. I think one of the tricks to efficiency is finding a way to release your air freely, you know, let go of all the inhalation muscles, let those totally relax as you exhale so that you're not working against yourself that, you know, and trusting that, right. Mm. Having, you know, ways where you can do that freely. One of the other ways I really like to do that is if you take your, you take your big slide off, hopefully, Oh, Hey, look at that. And you just buzz down the lead pipe. <laughs> Sounds lovely, hey? But that freedom of vibration that you get there is a great teacher for when you go to play. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah, helps fill out the buzz, make the buzz more resonant and full. I know so. uh, Dominic Spera taught like a lot of uh, warm-ups like that, like full mouth, mm -hmm. like lead pipe. Take the tuning side out, just lead pipe and mouthpiece warm-up and that he was kind of ready to go in a few minutes, but... Um, and it's, it's amazing, you know, it's just um, that the focus is on, on uh, efficiency and, and finding that, that kind mm -hmm. of sweet spot. I know one of the things I see all the time in that beginner band thing is, is um, teachers that go, okay, little, little Jimmy, right, and little, little Jill, okay, let's, let's everyone go like this. And so that first sound is always... You know that kind of and it's so scrunched and there's no you know there's no there's no air behind it and there's no relaxation and the you know it's just um yeah it, it, it yeah it's, it, it's it's hard you know um like having now had a few years it's, it's been really informing to teach a large group of beginner band students right at it's, the college uh, it's yeah. definitely a, yeah, like we have a next year we'll have a hundred and two grade sevens at our school, it's just unbelievable. Like, is it, we're gonna have twenty five beginning trumpet players, you know? But they're mixed in with another class, you know. In some ways, you're you're limited by the situation where you have to find a sort of middle role that works 
for as many students as possible, right? And then, you know, you have to, like good teachers, you have to assess and try to find ways to help each individual in their different journeys, right? Right. But, you know, a lot of those techniques come from just the, uh, the yeah, just like the, uh, the need to be efficient within that setting, right? Yes. You're trying to open doors of music to so many kids and so many different instruments. Um, you know, you kind of have to find what works and roll with it and... Yeah, help them out as That's they go. That's a whole different skill set too, right? Um, oh, totally, we, totally. We, we could it's... have sessions just talking about that. But, um, oh, I, I have to interject. Anybody who's writing a comment, because I'm getting some comments coming in on some of people who have shared links. I can't see those. I can't monitor those because I'd have to start clicking in on all the places that's been shared. All I have is what's seen on my music page. So if, if you see the root one or watch from the root one, then I can see those comments. Um, Okay, um, but we're talking about, uh, we're right kind of in the middle of seeing uh, things that most trumpet players are struggling with and, and how to overcome that. So uh, we're talking basically about managing efficiency. Can you just mm -hmm. demonstrate the, the, what you're talking about then, about just... Oh, sure, absolutely. I mean, just starting like within the basic realm of the instrument, you know, from my very first note of the day, I'm always thinking of that tone ahead of time, right? So I usually, I actually usually start on an E, you know, whatever work note works for you. Mm, I get that in my head. You know, I hear some of my favorite trumpet players. One of them ap ap happens to be Adam, like from the, our lovely CPO here. Adam just has a beautiful tone and I try to imitate and hear his sound in my head. Uh, but then what I do is I, I add a breath to that. Mm -hmm. So I hear that tone in my head. And I just start moving free air with that. without any time yet, right? I'm just thinking sound and breath. And then, you know, I've done those a few times. I've kind of created a bit of an MO, like a bit like of a path. Really, honestly, when you breathe in, because I've seen you do this so many times in person, but when you breathe in, I watch all the muscles in your body relax. <sighs> Absolutely. Almost like, you know, you, you don't lose posture, but you just, you know, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm it's exaggerating worth... a bit, but. It's worth mentioning that um, I really consciously worked on that for a long time, and I still do. Um, like, from my understanding of physiology, maybe somebody would correct me on this, but um, you know, really there are pretty much two separate sets of muscles. One is responsible for inhalation, one is responsible for exhalation, right, and the movement of air out, right. And I think most players, and this is really hard, and this actually used to be taught. Um, and some people would still argue that this is actually a good way to play, it, and I don't disagree with it, but I, for me, it doesn't work that way. Um, but, you know, originally they used to say, you know, keep your stomach strong. And if you do that, you can actually hear, maybe you can't, but in the tone of my voice, do you hear the change in the resonance? Mm -hmm. It might not be apparent over the, the Zoom world. But um, you lose freedom of mo movement, and that cuts resonance. That cuts ease of vibration, right? Everything um, you just so said what I found is you really want to try to, when you inhale, yeah. let go of the exhale muscles. Yeah. So I usually just think of a sigh and just let yeah. it all fall down, except obviously you have to keep your posture, right? Yes. And the same on the exhalation. When I reach the top of the inhalation, I just let it go to start. Now, here, you want to? I can get a little deeper here if you're cool. I, there's yeah. a little exercise I do that you might find valuable. I, I was never taught this. I just kind of figured this out. Um, a way to kind of bridge the gap because you do have to blow air out, right? At some point, if you just let air out, you're going to come to a neutral position, about maybe uh, thirty percent from empty. Like you have to be able to blow into that, right? So what I do is actually sort of bridge the gap. That's a lot of my thought and playing. Bridge the gap between something very natural and something you actually actively have to do. So the first thing I'll do is I'll take a really full breath and let everything out. When I get to neutral then, I will start to blow. Kind of studying the two components. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to blow out a little bit before I reach neutral. Okay, so it's not going to quite get to that resting point. I'm going to start blowing a little earlier.
get it closer. I'm going to get it closer to where I release the air and then start to blow. Now they're going to match. So I'm going to release, but also blow at the same time. And that's where I feel I can get that rush of air. You know, whether I need all of that for a certain note, but it's really great to have, right, in reserve. Well, even so generally even if, when I'm getting started, even if you're playing a, a pianissimo note, you, you want that breath, right? Like you want that, you want that full support, even if you're not going to really. It depends how long you're going to play. Like if I exactly. don't have to play long, I, I won't actually overdo it. Because if I just kind of just minimize a bit, I'm going to get better response, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the same freedom though, right? It's mm -hmm. right. I think that's what you're aiming for. But on the big one, when you're doing the warm up, you want that like it's almost like a bellows, right? Mm -hmm. You want to harness that energy. And once I have the freedom, then you start to move up and down the instrument a little bit. Trying to not let it go up or down. We think up or down, try to think level. And if you're having a hard time with that, go the opposite direction. So if you're going up, think down. If you're going low, think high. I'm not, yeah, never, that doesn't look good. <laughs> but we'll work on the choreography later. But no, I get what you're saying. It's really interesting. Yeah, and then you know, then it's just a matter of moving through the horn. I find when you have that efficiency, that freedom of air, it allows you to, you know, once you're warmed up, and you know, you have a good, clear sound happening, it allows you to move up and down the horn real easily. You know, if you can come down off the high notes and still have a nice, clear, resonant tone in the bottom kind of one of the indications you're doing it pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. Well put. Um, and then, you know, you add a little bit of sugar on that with a little bit of a mouthpiece. You know, I, I use a pretty large mouthpiece generally from quintet playing and stuff just so I can get a little bit swollen if I need to when I'm playing those shows because the blood rushes there that gets bigger. Add a little bit of, a little bit more of a, this is an Alan Vazuti. Mm -hmm. This is a jazz. It's not actually I used to play one of those for a long time, actually. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I used to play the Bobby Shuley, but I found it too squirrely. Um, it's a small but for this one, once I've got that efficiency, then you just sit back and let, let the mouthpiece do the work, right? You know, and then if you need to, you give a little Maynard Ferguson. Uh. Yeah, play us a Maynard Ferguson thing right now. While you, while you oh, know. let's see. Well, I've got something in my head that's Maynard Ferguson-ish. Yeah, let's hear it. It's, let's it's hear a cool it, line yeah. from the, the rock opera Tommy that I like to play. It's, it was featured in a Blue Devils marching band show, I think, or drunk corps show. I want to say like 89. And it's pretty epic. Anyways, hopefully this, this might kill Zoom, Johnny. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Dubba at the end. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, it's got to make sure it's there once in a while. Like, so when I have to do it a bunch, I can pull it out of the woodwork, you know? It's true. I don't make you do it too much, but um, but it might happen more and more. Um, <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have shown you that too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, note. Yeah, don't give me ideas. He's um, got that known. Okay, so right now, because we've been, uh, you've been, you know, we've all been in different focus modes lately, of course, in the last year and a half, but um, who are your current trumpet heroes and what are you working on in your playing right now? Well, um, right now I've been, actually been listening to a lot of Freddie Hubbard and really? just uh, getting in. Yeah. So I wasn't, wasn't expecting that. Which no, albums? Right? What, what albums are you listening to? My favorites well, are... Well, I didn't even know the album names. Red I just got Clay. it on Shuffle on iTunes and just taken okay. in. The one I've been listening to more lately is Red Clay. Yeah, Red Clay is one of my favorites. Herbie Hancock, right? Yeah. And so I, just, I had that on today too, just listening to it. It's like... 
I mean, Freddie has such a huge range, right? Like his ballad stuff is so unique. And yes. then, you know, I just, I, when I hear him play swing stuff and a little bit edgier swing stuff, I'm kind of like, wow, that's, it's really cool. So I'm trying to get into that and, you know, hear the articulation of that. I haven't really been practicing his Have his you transcribed so any of the solos yet? Not Freddie's, no, not yet. Okay. Um, that's, I've that's... done some of the, uh, I actually got into doing some of the bassy stuff. Like I mm -hmm. did the solo from Corner Pocket. It's been a, it's been a year since I was working on it, so I probably couldn't just pull it out, but yeah, just, you know, and what I found really cool about that is just kind of, you know, for me, trying to get in and hear, hearing the progressions, hearing, playing the harmony and really kind of learning how guys are doing that, uh, which that was, that's definitely out of my comfort zone, right? Yeah. That's newer for me. So I've been trying to really, uh, really do that. And, you know, the other one's Clifford and doing um, Joy Spring, right? That's one I've, I've been, I've been kind of slowly working into. Hmm. Well, you and, know, that's a favorite of mine. Oh yeah, it's yeah. it's a great song. I mean, his solo on that is mind altering. Like I, I've been looking at that pretty carefully. I haven't worked on playing it a whole lot yet, honestly. But just yeah. kind of looking at it and hearing it, and it's uh, it's I, it's pretty intense. I, you so. know, a number of years ago, I lifted uh, because Cl Clifford is one of my my main four trumpet yeah. players that I've kind of studied most of my life, and. Uh, I, I realized I hadn't lifted a Clifford solo in, in years. And so I just started working on one because uh, one of my students came and said, you know, I'm going to work on um, uh, uh, Stomping at the Savoy. And, oh. and that is such a crushing solo. And, uh, and then the, the week passed and I said, how's it going? He goes, it's hard. This one's hard, you know, and he's good at lifting. He's a, my, my, this, uh, one of my students is really, really good at lifting, but, uh, and he's doing it frequently. But, and I said, yeah. Yeah, I started working on it too, and there's there's some stuff there. Like, there's a lot to yeah. there's so much language, and beauty and idea in his playing. And so I've uh, I've slowed the process down working on this one. It's taken me a little more time, but um, oh yeah, oh like you have to like I mean it's just and there's no nothing wrong with that, right? It's just take it slow, note by note. Yeah, and then know. life gets in the way sometimes too. So I can't uh, yeah, there, there's these little things called children. Yeah. And, <laughs> You know, yeah, well, yours uh, aren't so little they're, anymore. Um, no, they're they're large now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're uh, they're beautiful, beautiful young ladies. Just uh, Anna's actually going into junior high this year. Can you believe that? I can't uh, actually. That's uh, hurting my brain a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I she's still remember. Gonna start, she's going to start roundup band this fall. Oh man, I I remember, <laughs> like, I, it really seems like like it was last Christmas that we were doing. Um, Rocky Mountain Symphony Orchestra together. Um, there was a piano soloist I remember. We were in a big, big, beautiful cathedral. I can't. Yeah, anyway. St. Mary's. I think Derek too, yeah. right? That's right, yeah. Derek. He was he was amazing that night. And and the, uh, um, you know, for for me to come, I love coming to play in in those types of things because I don't do them as often. And, yeah, totally. But, uh, but I remember your daughters running around playing Princess and the and then and then we were touring with that symphony and I I just remember all they were always there because you and your wife were both playing in the symphony you and Andrea and and uh, and so they were always in the back room and someone one of us was always checking in on them oh um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and at cjo shows and stuff too and and i remember them being in the the back room that i always had set up for kids when we were rehearsing in the main studio to, that they could always go back and always toys and everything i remember them coming out uh, seriously this feels like yesterday when they were <laughs> coming out in um we had a bunch of uh, like dress up costumes and they came out in like princess costumes and and different things they found back there in the middle of rehearsal, right? Like I, I, yeah. That, anyway, it just feels, yeah. I can't, I, uh, I can't believe how yeah. big they are now. It's, um, yeah, I know you, you got a glimpse of them there behind me. I mean, yeah, they're, yeah. Just before we started the, the, the zoom, um, the live stream, they came in on zoom and I, I Oh yeah. Shocked. They came in earlier. Yeah. We yeah. got a chance to meet earlier. I was just shocked. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, what is your favorite show that we've done with the Calgary Jazz Orchestra? Um, that, that's actually that's actually really tough. You know, um, I you know I really enjoyed the, the the Frank shows; those are always fun, like the Christmas ones, and especially when the opportunity to tour. Uh, I think we did yeah. that show in the Lethbridge that really just that killed. You know, that was fun. Uh, we did that really a lot smoking. of years on the tour, but for some reason the Lethbridge stop was always a 
just a killing fun night, wasn't it? Like Yeah, well, that, that church, that's a fantastic church. I, I wish I could remember it offhand, but I know like the Lethbridge Community Band plays there. It's a great space. To, that was my favorite. I, I really enjoyed the concert hall because we, we did it at a bunch of different locations there for some mm -hmm. reason that we kept moving it around. They kept moving it around. But the concert hall, I found, was really fun, too. The um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. We did it at the, the university, right? Yeah. As well. Yeah, they had a beautiful, large um, hall there. But the yeah. but there was something really, yeah. Um, but do you have a show outside the Perfectly Frank Christmas that we've done? Yeah, I do. It's the, the Sweet Jubilation one. That's oh, always... really? Oh, absolutely, good. absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are moments in that where it's just, uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to fudge about too much, but I love the music, man. I really oh, do. Music. It's uh, it's more cathartic. Like it, It's so powerful when you're in the midst of it playing. I, I think it's, I can't remember the, it's been a while. I don't remember the title. It's the one that just builds and builds. You know which, which movement I'm talking about? Oh, that's about? the end of uh, He Is Risen. Yeah, it's just uh, like the exaltation, yeah. right? You know, yeah. of course, there's the super fast uh, gospel thing the at the end, too. Which at is, the very end, yeah. Yeah, that's just kicking, right? You know, I tried to write that whole, the whole first eight movements. I tried to build up to the end of the eighth movement that, that you were just singing a bit of there. And then have Rich Harding and then just write that so that Rich Harding can just be rich on top and just elevate us all. And then and then bring it back down into a fun thing. And a, and, a, and a you know with that or uh, with a serious beautiful thing with the Alleluia and then a fun thing where we do kind of a traditional but then it just goes right to that that double time thing at the end where <laughs> I, uh, I I we're all I, just hanging on there man <laughs> oh man it's um it's cooking <laughs> it's cooking the uh, the uh, we got uh, that was the show the first show that got canceled was um, the replay of of Sweet That's right, yeah, so yeah. I think I'm going to it's on the list of next season to play in April. So I think we'll do Sweet oh, Jubilation awesome. in April. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it, it's hard to describe what it was. It's It almost feels transcendental when you're in that moment, when you've reached after the long work, you know, with a huge ensemble performing and you're in that moment, you know, and part of it too, I'm sure, is screaming the high notes and hanging on to it and just, you know, giving it everything you got. Yeah. But it, it was, it's really transcendental, you know. And, and the, uh, I found I find that the who's choir who's talking about it. Oh, I'm glad, man. I, I find the choir um, such an amazing addition to the big band too, right? To the to the orchestra. Oh yeah. That I I get I get goosebumps. And the very first time we did it, um, the the very first time we when we premiered the piece um, before we recorded it and everything, I I'd heard it in my head. You know, um, when I was writing it and then I, you know, when we rehearse, we rehearse all the different sections. So I, yeah. I don't even know if we actually rehearse song. Maybe we rehearsed a few of the movements all the way through. But, you know, you rehearse sections and you rehearse. Yep. So the first time I ever heard the whole piece live from beginning to end was was the premiere. And yeah. I um, yeah, I had goosebumps. You guys just gave me um, I mean, I was conducting and directing for most of it and, you know, soloing a little but like just listening to you, you guys all do it with the choir i was just um i had goosebumps and i was just I, I just was shaking because the power you guys were putting out the soul that you guys were playing with was uh, it was overwhelming like it was um yeah man yeah, yeah. well it, it was it's fantastic I think you I, know it's great in the middle of that too because there's there's lovely al Meerhead, right who's just beautiful human being beautiful player mm -hmm. but he does turn to me in the beginning of probably the sixth moment he says have we played this before <laughs> <laughs> Sure, just <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you can sight read, Al. Oh, man. oh that's great. Um, what's uh, let's talk about your role. So most of the time with the CJO, you probably ninety percent of the time now you're playing lead parts, or ninety five percent of the time. Um, yeah. I know when um, when I first like when I was when we first started the CJO, I was playing a lot of lead, most of the lead. Um, but of course I, you know, uh, I really wanted to do more solo work, but then, and of course, if I'm singing it, I find that difficult to play lead trumpet and sing at the same time. Um, yes. but I was trying to do that and it, it was crazy, almost impossible to, to try to be a, like a soloist, a trumpet soloist and play lead. Like 
totally. even, even still today, like if I'm hired to play lead, I, I almost never want to solo, you know, maybe once or twice, but because right. the focus is so different and the approach is so different. But I remember, um, but, but like, yeah, because originally I think uh, we would share a bunch and I could, I just felt I never could keep up to you because I was, uh, my focus was so divided and, and, uh, and you were doing such a killing job and really you're, and I've said this to many people, but you're, you're, you're a great trumpet player and, and I, I just love playing in a section with you, um, especially when, you know, when we have Al and Al Muirhead and John Day with us. Um, and, and back in the day when Gordon Wilhelm played with us and, oh, yeah, and he was man. such a great, he's such a great trumpet player too. But, um, so now you're, you're, you know, uh, you know, through all these experiences and stuff, you're, you're such a strong lead trumpet player and stylistic. And I know when we go into things like the Frank show, um, and, and, and then the, all the different styles of music we perform, I know, uh, I ask a lot of everyone because we need to ch switch gears and study the, the, the music and the style that we're, you know, we're playing. But what really, through all of this, is the role of the lead trumpet player in a jazz orchestra? And what are the most important things to focus on when you're playing lead? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> in my experience, um, I think one of the most important things is actually helping to set the collegiality tone of the group. Like, the first thing is actually interpersonal, I, I think. I mean, everyone there can play the snot out of their horns, right? Um, but just making sure that we're all there together and that we're all on the same team. I mean, it's never an issue. But you just kind of want to make sure, you know, it, sometimes it might be perceived as being a bit of a clown. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, you know, I think you like in my experience, you get such a better project if everyone's loose and uh, everyone's uh, feeling good about working with each other. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're just keeping that center focus. That's that's number one. Um, yeah, number two is just uh, trying to make sure you got a good handle of the style, especially reaching out across the band to the lead alto. You know, Jerry, right? You know, so just and I think Jerry and I over the years just we've we've always kind of we hear each other really well. I think, which is is, is an advantage. We like that. You mentioned the ensemble noir show. Uh, actually, Jerry and I played in that in Toronto. That's that's oh, really? like they hired us to do. Uh, a thing so that was actually my first experience playing with Jerry and we did a whole large uh, full-length concert of trio alto sax trumpet and tuba <laughs> I know That's right normal yeah 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 absolutely it sounds difficult you know like you're whenever you whenever you play in smaller ensembles the difficulty is that you're so exposed and you usually have to carry a lot of the show um, but you know what difficult. it was it was actually easy and I think that a lot of that came back to just like, you know, and like, hopefully Jerry would feel the same, but it's just so easy to work with Jerry, yeah, right? And we listen to each other, you know, our concepts are generally pretty close. And if they're not, we kind of find each other, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that communication and making sure we got style and of course, like the beat, the rhythm, right? Um, just really making sure everything's locked in time-wise, you know, it's uh, when you're in a big band, I think it's easy especially as you get into the bigger brass to, to, to kind of uh, just get a little bit on the back side of things too much sometimes. Sometimes. Um, I'm not talking sometimes about Sometimes the rhythm section gives us a look. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's the <laughs> you guys are thing. hanging back in time a little bit there. Uh, Cody yeah. will give us a look. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think so. Yeah. Finding that rhythm. In it. And actually, it's, it's often underrated, but uh, pitch, right? That's and and the volume, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. and, volume. and the volume, like. We were talking earlier. I mean, there's a lot of joy in letting it rip, but I would say probably five or ten percent of the time do I actually play like really loud or really high. It's five percent. You know? Yeah, ninety really percent of the time is just trying to be tasteful. Yeah, keeping it really in the pocket. Yeah, you know, and then you know when Jerry hears that, we kind of just we stick at that lighter dynamic. We don't overdo it, and that keeps everybody fresh for the show. And yeah. That sort of thing. So yeah, Until I mean, it's, it's time to open up, and for, for you know, yeah. you know, that's that's always something that I've that I'm that I've always 
dictated um you know uh, sometimes you know cutting the band off in rehearsal going like what's going on why are we why are we <laughs> why are we turning up so much because it you, you don't have um the kind of the fluidity to be stylistic if you're always at full power um but then also when we when we need that full power when you turn it on and the band turns it on it's it's overwhelming right it's Right. The more contrast. Yeah. Yeah. Much more impact. Um, I mean, I love when I see pianos because I'm like, I'm going to make it so hard for them to play as soft as I am. And I (laughs) have the advantage being classically, you know, oriented that I do play soft quite a bit because like an orchestra, sometimes you got to be like featherweight, gentle on exposed stuff, right? Yeah. So just having done a lot of that, it, you know, kind of lends itself. And like people, I can't hear you, Jay. Well, no, actually. You, you can't should, hear me. You should be quieter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I, you know, I often have to talk to Jim about that. You know, over on drums, like, hey, rhythm section can do dynamics too. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hitting what? things. <laughs> what? But you know, it's, um, it, it, you know, I kind of make it a jest. But like, if you push the envelope with how soft you can play, you know, and you back off from that a little bit so it's comfortable, right? But then you have so much more contrast for your audience, right? Absolutely. Way more exciting. Yeah. Way more exciting. Very cool. Um, what there you go, theme, buddy. What theme, what theme, what theme should we do with the CJO that we haven't done? Uh, what theme haven't we done that we should do? I've had a couple of thoughts over there. I mean, you mentioned Beatles earlier. I think that would be that would be, be fun. It would dynamite. be, uh, you know, I'd want to rearrange, like, like not rearrange, but like uh, I always use the term, as you know, um, reimagine. I'd love to yes. reimagine and, and write some different takes on that. But like music like yesterday, yesterday's and, um, and Blackbird and there are so many beautiful songs oh, and then there's so many stuff, fun yeah. songs like Hey Jude. And, you know, I think actually, as I'm saying all this, I think we did a Beatles night, gosh, like 15 years ago in our second or third season. Um, yeah. I'm sure I wouldn't want to reuse any of the things I wrote back then, but... <laughs> I'd write a whole new show. Uh, Well, that is true. In that setting, though, you're going to have a, that would be a lot of work on the arranging part, right? Yeah. To do it like that. But it could be really, really cool. I mean, hopefully something you can use again, right? Yeah. When it comes back. You know, one of the things I would actually, I'd love to do is, um, one one of my favorite kind of modern big bands is the uh, Darcy James Argue. uh, Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's an incredible writer. Yeah. Yeah, and like his his uh, album Infernal Machines, um, <laughs> such cool stuff. Now I, I am a little biased to that because I I got to play that stuff with Ingrid Jensen once. Oh, okay. And Christine, both of them on the same show with Foothills Brass. We did a show with Ingrid and Christine and John Weekon, um, Ingrid's husband who plays, and actually Joel Miller, Christine's husband, played too. Mm-hmm. And we did a bunch of shows and man, but we played some of the Darcy James Argy stuff written for small ensemble and it was just so cool wow um, yeah the infernal yeah, machines i think that was the that, one that really sticks in my mind that could be one of my favorites actually of his he's yeah. such a such a great writer like he really is um yeah and yeah, one the of, other thing that I sticks in my head my too is lead trumpet players that plays with him is um seneca black have you heard seneca oh yeah yeah i, um, I haven't heard much but i mean i, I yeah, obviously <laughs> heard the band play i haven't heard enough but of his his like of him playing lead but i heard him first live with jazz on lincoln center and he yeah. was sitting in the in the back row um just melting through all registers swinging his tail off like it was nothing you know, like it was the easiest thing. Like it was just, just me sitting here like this. Oh, yeah, no big deal. Just talking. And he was, you know, around double C's and, and all around. But it was liquid and beautiful and musical and swinging. And, and just before the lockdown, actually, I heard him playing lead with Harry Connick Jr. in New York um, in, a, in a live concert. And he was amazing. Like, but I think he plays lead with um, – Darcy James argues too, but awesome, yeah. I don't know if it's on all the records, but sorry. And, and the another, other another show I'd love to do uh, would be uh, kind of like, well, I mean, you could do. I could play this stuff all day. The Art of the Tango, right? And I don't. Do you know Raúl Tabera? Have you met Raúl? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just wonderful drummer, right? A yes. Wonderful Colombian drummer, and it, yeah, bringing someone like that in to kind of augment it. We don't do a whole lot of Latin, Latin right? We sorry? don't do a lot of Latin. No, we don't. <laughs> and. I'm kind of biased to it. I like it. It's uh, 
get a lot of fire. I like uh, chocolate armanteros, right? Yeah. Oh man. We did Smooth do a Cuba player. night once. We did, but but generally speaking, we don't do as much of it. Yeah, you're right. I did yeah, write a tango kind of for um, to feature the string section at our Art of Romance show, la right before the lockdown. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but I did write that for for that and for we did some shows before that I wrote it for, and then we used it at the Art of Romance. But it featured um, Angela Smart on the violin. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't remember the name of it, but okay. So Latin and and maybe yeah, you know a song I do that maybe I a Latin Beatles show. Latin Beatles. <laughs> um, there's a chart. I, I like to play the uh, the violin, the Itat Croman part for uh, Tango para una Carbeza by Carlos Gardel. Oh, it's, one of, it's actually a feature piece I've done a fair bit over the years. Ba -ba -de -be -ba -de you know the. Ba -ba -da -ba -de. Can you play a little? What's that? Play a little. Play a little of it. Oh, oh God. Let's see if I can. It's been a while. Well, here's the main melody. I'm pretty sure I can remember the melody. I haven't played this. No, of course I haven't played it in a couple of years, right? there <laughs> yeah <laughs> no but the violin part though you know starts off with a real flair let's see if i can remember how this goes i remember the first figure major scale in a way now but I can't remember <laughs> where it was okay well look at that okay okay one of the things uh do you have any memories that are that, that stories or things that happened that were interesting or funny or something that well let's see i mean i sit next to the trombones yeah sorry about that <laughs> it's kind of kind of constant ah oh, man you know like some of the melody it really like the the biggest memories are just hearing my fellow players just jamming you know like, and it's hard to draw specifics because, like, they're always jamming, yeah. you know. But uh, standing next to L, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like it's a being in a master class, yeah. being in a concert, uh, being in a lesson, being in a candy shop all at once, right? Yeah. Like, you're literally listening to mastery with every note he plays, right? I mean, holy cow. Can't wait to play with that guy again, right? I was just talking uh, about but everybody, you know, Jeremy, of Igor. Uh, yeah, right. And Rich, I was, I mean, was just, just talking to a student about the importance of of listening to Al Muirhead because he was he was listening to one of his records too, and you know Al learned to play from a generation orally that had a different approach to music. No matter what we try to study, it's very difficult to actually touch the nuances and the depth of musical expression that he was part of that zeitgeist part of that you know when i when i got to play with um you know playing with tommy banks so much and playing with with al a million right. times through my life or getting to play with guido basso or when i when i was fortunate enough to play with um and work with uh, ellis marsalis uh, yeah th those players that reach a generation of sound and um and they they pull it forward for us so that we can we can just hear it right there and yeah anyway yeah, I mean, it's Al's, actually Al's recording with uh, PJ and Tommy that got me going on Joy Spring. Yeah, isn't it? I was just, you know, I I'm I listen to Al in my car all the time, probably more than anybody else, honestly. Wow. Because it's just it's so, like you said, I mean, I call it, I say tasty, graceful, yeah. and yet so simple, right? Most of the time, it's simple, but like it's. It's I remember I remember Wynton Marsalis talking about this once and, and he said something to the effect of um uh I, it was something like the the interviewer said mm -hmm. uh plays you know you're this great trumpet player play something technical something difficult and and he played like a really swinging blues line that was you know just something that was really and the guy kind of looked at him, you know, with yeah, all the yeah. things that Winton can play. He's incredible. And, and 
and went and, and, and my memory's foggy on this, but went and said something to the effect of nuance is the highest level of technique. So I like it's, it. it's like when you, you listen to Miles and you go, oh, he's playing is really simple. I'm like, okay, cool. You're right. It is. Now try to play it. And with yeah, the man. soul and the little nuances and vibrato and everything at the right time and the right way and the ability to do that improvisationally off the cuff and just like your speed. Yeah, it's, just like your it's wild when you think about it. It's incredible. I mean, it's a play like – like I think about, man, how great would it be able to just be able to do that, right? Yeah. So yeah, I actually started transcribing some of El Solos. Like it. Good. Mm. Yeah, man, totally. Don't yeah. tell him though. I won't. He might. I, he might I, be I, more egotistical than he is already. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I, uh, I, I, as you know, I studied with him for f four years in university, and all I did was just try to steal from him all day long, every day. All day long, every day, you know, just, <laughs> just every time we played together, and just um, I remember once we were we were playing. A th I, I, I'm trying to think what we were playing, like um, oh man, um, it was some old trad tune like like Dinah or something. And 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 what Al would do for me and let to me in lessons all the time. He's like, do you know um, do you know Dinah or whatever? You know, do you know Big Butter and Eggman? And I'm like, Big Butter, huh? And he would just go, oh, and he'd just start playing. And he just played, Dina, you know, some, like he'd start playing a tune. And I'm just sitting beside him going, um, like, what am I supposed to do? And then he'd, he'd just keep playing the melody over and over. And so I started kind of working on you know, kind of half looking at his fingers and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. listening and trying to figure out what he was playing and uh it was a while till i realized that this was the lesson because he'd start playing and then as soon as i got the melody down he'd start playing bass lines you know And, and and laying down swing and I'm like oh and so I'd start getting the bass lines and trying to pick out the chord changes and 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 you know and, and he was starting with simple tunes and uh, for me and then I started getting that and so I'd start being like oh okay and I start playing the bass lines and be like yeah and then he'd start improvising be playing bass lines I'm like okay and then I started getting the tune and getting the harmonics and then he'd you know we'd go back and forth so I'd play bass lines and he'd solo and then he'd play bass lines I'd solo and we'd trade fours like that and and we'd go back and forth for hours and hours and hours on a tune on a single tune and uh and he would play something that was like the sweetest little you know just just um um You know, he'd play something really simple, and I'd try to be like, "Oh yeah, I can, I can do that," and I'd mimic it, and <laughs> and uh, and then I or I'd be like, "Oh, I can, I can, I can play," you know, something fast, and then and better than that, and or no, and, and he'd play something fast, and I'm like, "Oh, okay, that was better. Okay, I'll play something really chill <laughs> and really, yeah, because you played fast, so I'm gonna play really chill," and then he'd play something far hipper with like three notes, you know, like <laughs> it was like that for hours and hours, for years and years, and. I, I just tried to steal everything from him. Anyway, that's, yeah, that's one of my Almir head stories, but um, yeah. I have many. But yeah, he, he really is. He's just, uh, he's, I mean, he's out, right? Yeah, man. I mean, those those are the memories, like coming back to it, like the the, the people you play with. And, you know, and the crowds too, like, you know, yeah. like some of the little big band crowds, even some of the weddings and stuff, like that we played in some other settings. Like they just, it's a blast. I remember... You know, when I first moved to Vancouver a few years back, and I came back in December to play, we played at Kananaskis, right? Um, uh, at the uh, Pomeroy. I think it was a wedding reception at the Pomeroy in December of uh, 2018. Um, okay. Yeah, but that one sticks out too, just because it's like, it had been such a long time since so we had a chance to play. You know, and really I am with the Horn Buddies, Tim and, and Shane and Rich, and just back in the saddle and just having a blast, you know? I'm trying to even uh, remember which one that was. 
you know we've yep. played so many shows through the years like yep um i think we you and i started playing together about 10 years ago now I, yeah it's amazing yeah. it's been that long and when when i was finally fortunate enough to to pl play with you because you'd, you'd moved to town a number of years before that of course but um when i was finally fortunate enough to play with you it felt like we've been playing together our whole lives you know it was just it was just easy it was it was yeah, like you're saying playing with jerry jerry's one of the, Jerry Bear is one of the easiest musicians to play with because he will follow the lead player, but he does it with such confidence and style of his own. He studies oh, yeah. the styles he plays, and he plays so in tune and in time and reads so well. It it um and it felt like that when I was playing with you. You know, you'd always play in time. You'd always play in tune. That was always yeah, your focus. Go figure. The band directors, hey. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of the most important things. Um. Well, I, I, one of the things that I think you're really known for with the Calgary, amongst the musicians of the Calgary Jazz Orchestra was uh, before one of the rehearsals, you arrived significantly early and, and got me to be your, your um, assistant chef. And uh, uh, you made your, uh, your, your deep dish Michael Ack, um, Chicago wishes it could make this um, pizza and then headed in the oven during the first half of rehearsal. And it was, it was so uh, filling and incredible and satisfying that the entire group, the entire group of professional musicians completely lost focus because they were not professional anymore. Com they, we, nobody could focus. It literally, uh, we could not re effectively rehearse after. I, I think oh, I called it after about 20. No, everyone was no one just- could breathe. No one could breathe. There was no room left. <laughs> Everyone ate way too much of this. Thing. That was one of the most amazing pizzas I've ever had in my life. Um, what What is the secret of the Michael Ack deep dish pizza? Oh, my. Well, the, there's a couple. I mean, well, <laughs> this is going to sound ridiculous, but it's the sauce <laughs> yeah. and it's the, the crust. You make the dough. You make it all that yet. Uh, yeah, it's all from scratch. So I make the sauce from scratch. I make and it. I usually cook that for about forty-eight hours. Like it's a, it's like a stew. It's like a tomato stew, right? And the longer you cook it, the like you know you lose the acidity of tomatoes, and it just gets real smooth. Mm. Um, in, in like a couple of pizzas, I'll usually put almost a full cup of garlic. Like, but once you cook it down for a couple of days, just you know it's smooth, right? Right. Um, you know the crust is actually like. It's kind of a combination of pizza and biscuit. And it, that was actually the hardest part to figure out. Because, like, being from Chicago, and when I first moved to Calgary, I got to tell you, I was so disappointed. So I saw the these pizza. signs, In deep the dish Chicago pizza. pizza. Deep dish. I'm like, oh, Don't yes, they know what it is. Mm -hmm. And then we ordered one, and it was so disappointing. It was like, <laughs> oh, I was crushed. And I looked around town for years, and then somewhere around 2008, I decided to, to figure it out. Right, because even back in Chicago, nobody makes it. You just go to the store and once once a year and try not to die. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean it. Yeah, and usually good ingredients, right? Like spalumbo sausage and all sorts of good stuff. So, well, well. Oh, oh, I've got a visitor. She's not. Oh, a I couldn't get visitor. my daughter to come on screen. Um. Well, well, um, you know, maybe um, I, I think I don't know if it's gone out yet, but I think they're they're sending out an invitation for the uh, the CJO. Um, we're having a like an outside uh, picnic for all the musicians oh, nice. and, and and volunteers and board members of the CJO. So I might maybe you should bring some to that. That's uh, oh we yeah, need to have a pizza party soon. Yeah, man, um, we can do that. That'll be fun. Okay, so it's I've got so yeah, once a year we can do it. Yeah, it's I efficient. think once a year is okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm I I that it would take me that and a lot of running to uh, to recover from. We should start training now if we know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, we're gonna do a lightning. Unless you have any questions for me or anything else you want to say. I had something profound, but no, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it was so profound. It was so okay. good. Worth writing down. I'm going to give you a ton of questions and, and All right, uh, I'm ready. Um, try to answer them as correctly as possible. Um, <laughs> you, will be, you will be judged. You will be judged. Perfect. All right. Oh, is that on your end? 
there's like a yeah so i'm getting notifications my my daughter is like is it time to go yet and i'm like not quite <laughs> okay soon okay number one do you think it's cool that they put an s in the word lisp absolutely yes uh if an orange is orange why isn't a lime called a green or a lemon called a yellow that would be too base very basic if you did that <laughs> okay um what would you do or what should you do if you were to see an endangered animal eating an endangered plant oh man i'd, I'd cheer yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Nature, baby. If horrific means to make horrible, shouldn't what what would terrific mean? To make terrible. Okay. So <laughs> when you like tell me I'm doing a terrific job, <laughs> that's, yes, that's we okay. say that all the time, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> you were terrific on that concert. Um, I really liked what you were trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> I loved what you were trying to do. I loved your choice of tempos in that last um <laughs> tempos. Why is the word abbreviation so long? Oh my god. Uh wow. It's just so that you could ask me this question right now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um what happens if you get scared to death twice? <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, you start playing flugel. Okay. I have never, uh, I've never heard anybody play uh, a, a, a bugle type call on a flugel before. Can you play something else on the flugel? A bugle flugel? A, <laughs> a, a yes. Uh, let's see, what should I play? No. Oh. Beautiful. Um, bugle flugel. Beautiful flugel. Uh, is there another word for synonym? Synonym. <laughs> <laughs> How many trumpet players does it take to change a light bulb? I know this. Five. One to do it and four to tell them how much better they could do it. <laughs> how many bass players does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many what? How many bass, uh, bass players does it take to screw in a light bulb? None. The piano None. player can do it with their left hand. <laughs> okay, okay. If Barbie is so popular, why do you have to buy her friends? Well, because she couldn't make any on her own. Ouch. Um, how do trumpet players greet one another? Um, hi, I'm better than you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how do you know who the best trumpet player in a room is? I don't know that one. They'll tell you. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do you make a trumpet sound like a French horn? Put your hand on the bell. And miss a lot of notes. <laughs> Terrible. Um, Here's one for you, Johnny. Yeah. I like this one. Because, you know, we're both lead trumpet players and we're both band leaders, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see a trumpet player or the lead trumpet player and the band leader in the road, which one do you hit first and why? I, I don't know. The band leader. Business before pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh. <laughs> How do you get a trumpet player to take an up an octave and play triple forte as loud as they can? <laughs> Just hand them a piece of music. Yeah. <laughs> Just hand them sheet music. <laughs> any other dynamic written. Yeah, that's the same. Like, how do you get a guitar player to, to play quieter? Oh, that's put a piece of sheet music in front of them. Yeah. Give them a piece of music. <laughs> oh, goodness sakes. And lastly, 
Yes. What is the definition of a gentleman? <laughs> I'm going to guess uh, someone that can play the trumpet but doesn't. Yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, man. It's great to catch up with you, Jay. I miss you. Yeah, man. Really Holy do. cow. I miss playing, man. Like, you know, we like you said, we played a few gigs lately on our own and doing our own things, but it's going to be uh, an amazing thing when we get everybody together again. Yeah, it really is. It'll be a very fulfilling experience. I um, I personally definitely enjoyed this downtime we've had, but um, like we were talking earlier, well, you, you just had your first uh, live show uh, post-pandemic, and my first live one is tomorrow night um, in yeah, Calgary man. for, I think they're, I don't know entirely why, but they're limited because because the restrictions are off. Uh, but the as as we know in our business, it takes a long time to regrow calendars and sell tickets and put shows together. And but mm -hmm. um, tomorrow it's just limited to twenty five, I think, in the audience for some reason. So I'll be playing to a small, intimate crowd. But man, am I looking forward to it? It's gonna be great, man. Like just having people listening while you play is just such a huge thing. I mean, there's nothing like performing for people, is there? Yeah, no, not at all. No. Um, and I think we're going to get the Calgary Jazz Orchestra together for some reading sessions, um, possibly right. just uh, outside on my driveway. Um, it would be kind of fun. Um, we should do that a couple times over the summer here, but we're starting up again in October. So beginning yeah. of October, I think we'll, as you know, we do, uh, and for everyone listening, we do three rehearsals uh, for, a, for a concert of new music. So we'll... Um, I think we'll start rehearsing around the beginning or second week of October. I'm really looking forward to that. Everyone yeah, what, having remind me, what, what's, what, yeah, what's the show in October? I, I don't remember offhand. If it, it, it hasn't been sure announced. Yet. So, yeah. and I'm not 100% sure that this is what it'll be, but um, I'm 90% sure. Um, half the concert, the first half, because we missed, uh, we were going to bring in uh, Dan Brubeck, Dave Brubeck's son, as a drummer. Oh, cool. uh, who's an incredible drummer, um, but he um, and I was just writing with him today. But he, um, uh, I don't think it's going to work out to bring him in now this time for this show. Um, maybe in the future we can. But I think we're going to do the centenary, the cen celebrate the centenaries because we miss them of 2020 of Dave Brubeck yep. and um, Charlie Parker oh, and yeah. Clark Terry. Uh, so, so I think the first half of the show will be. Um, three condensed versions of what those shows would have been if we were able to do them during the, the year off. Uh, and the second half of the show, I think we're going to do uh, Disney Reimagined. Oh, nice. Because it just seems very celebratory to me. And I think we, we need to celebrate coming back. Um, yeah. For Christmas, Perfectly Frank Christmas, uh, the uh, February show, the first half, as always, is the uh, Art of Romance with the mm -hmm. CJ Owen Strings. And uh, Katie George is coming to sing with oh, us nice. for that one. Yeah, She's amazing. And then, um, uh, and Katie and I've been writing a lot together, so we might do a lot of new music for that. Yeah, and then the yeah, second so half, Art of Soul, and yeah. then um, where we do soul music. And then April, I think uh, we're gonna do Sweet Jubilation. Um, that's pretty pretty solid. And the the <laughs> other almost the whole show, right? <laughs> it almost is. And I remember the first time we did it. it uh, that was one of the, the comments. They said it was so overwhelming that it was, it was, yeah, it was like a whole show. But we'll do something, maybe nice forty minutes something beforehand. The music of Mingus or something fun, and then, um, and then the June show. I don't know, I don't know what we're gonna do. I'll be two themes, and I don't know what. But that's anyone listening. That's pro that's more than anybody else has heard because I still haven't decided. <laughs> I, it makes I, me a bit too, right? Yeah, it's what's that? It may change a bit too. It's cool. It may right? change a bit. Yeah. Got to figure out what works, right? And then I'm planning. I'm kind of planning the next, the 18th season at the same time because, um, I also wanted to do like we the the shows that were canceled. The um, the music of New Orleans, um, yeah. where we were going to do kind of everything from the Hot Five to New Orleans funk and Louis Armstrong to to uh, the Meters and Harry Connick Jr. and Dr. John and and Ellis Marsalis and just all of the great you know, um, Al Hurt, all the great, um, ah, I just forgot his name. Um, what's that song? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, yes, we can. Can Why can't we if we want to? Yes, we can. Can't we? And that like uh, working in a coal mine and LA and Tucson 
There it is. Um, oh, yeah, but just all, course, yeah. yeah, like all the great, you know, New Orleanian players. And so, yeah, um, right. and then we, we missed our, the Michael Jackson reimagine show, which I thought would have been really fun too. That's, so. Yeah. That's, that works so well. Yeah. So I, um, and I've written most of those shows, you know, or close, close to finish. So that's I want to awesome. schedule them back in sometime, but, uh, so I'm yeah. just kind of, I don't know. We'll see. You know how much I hem and haw and making the show <laughs> and the charts and gosh. Good man. Well, you gotta, you gotta leave yourself freedom, right? You know, so you can find with the right fit, right? Yeah. Which the board doesn't like. They're like, Hey, we want to get the posters <laughs> and marketing. <laughs> it's a marketing. Why can't you just pick it? Let's get the marketing done. I'm like, you know, you're right. You're, you're, you're right. Oh, buddy. Well, it's uh, it's gonna be a joy when we get a chance to play. So, let's uh, let's be, do that soon. Absolutely. Um, so let's say goodbye to everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone, for yeah. listening tonight. If you're listening live, if you're listening on a podcast or recorded, I hope you had a great day. And uh, um, I always have to find the little button here. So, um, can you play us a, a, a farewell fanfare? Uh, yes. Let's see. Let me play some on the piccolo trumpet. Okay. <clears throat> now that I'm not warmed up anymore, let's see what happens. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to go for it. Let's see what happens. Good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Thanks for having me, Johnny. Good to see you, buddy.